Rakshakti, Untera, Akhtim. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I am the Ephemeral One, and today I want to show you all my story. The story of the person I am, the long road behind, and hopefully shed some light on the road ahead. In short, this will be, I guess you would call it the lore, of me becoming who I am. You can treat this as just a story for another VTuber. That's perfectly fine. But I will admit this from the start. To me, all of this is as real as the air in my lungs. But I don't expect you all to believe that. But... I wanted to tell my story, and I've spent a very, very long time trying to sort it out. And over a decade at this point. And in doing so, I'm trying to sort out my emotions and feelings regarding these stories. So I decided to start and follow an old guidance of mine. If anyone is familiar with the tarot cards, they are are a, a are an old playing cards, and they're supposed to teach us and guide us towards, I guess, ascension or at least the feeling of making life worthwhile. And in doing so, the major arcana, yeah, is the big picture of your life in this long-term direction. The fool, the magician, the high priestess, the empress, the emperor, the hierophant, the lovers, the chariot, the strength, the hermit, wheel of fortune, justice, the hanged man, death, temperance, the devil, the tower, the star, the moon, the sun, judgment, and the world. I will begin to tell my story using this as a guide. And so, the fool, the simple start. The card no marked always with the number zero. The concept of nothing and everything stems from it. For that, my story, this, and to tell my story, the story of the ephemeral one, like anyone else's, it's never wholly only my tale, but those who led to me being. So, I start at the most relevant start, and honestly, it's a tale of not one, but two fools, two children. So, let me tell you of the story and the origin of the goddess Lysara. You've probably never heard of her. That's fine. And I accept the whole charge of being insane. That's fine. So, let me begin. The first act of there, the first act, a child beloved of mountain and sky. Some of those who've been following me for a while might recognize that as the character I named my first Elden Ring, my Elden Ring playthrough as. In a very place very unlike the one we know, lived a people unlike us. They tread upon four legs, yet still had two arms. And unlike our home, their home was more stony than dunked in water's depths. Mountains chained and stretched for endless miles, reaching towards the heavens. Tucked in the plentiful valleys were the people so different to us. The creatures toiled in the dark using claws and tools to scratch the mountains into dens. Towns grew as life took on a rhythm. Passages small and grand began to gnaw away at the rock. Life was discovered in hidden alcoves. Food became less scarce, and the people learned. In their learning, they began to give thanks. First, to the stone that provided challenge and strength to their homes. 
second to the sky, which gave him frequent water, but also cold. As time passed, the people's wishes grew. A child was one day born, and so their fates were sealed, some fatalistic sorts would say. Yet the child was greeted with cheers, for on the day of her birth it rained, and for four nights after the rain could be seen in the distance. This birthed something new in the neighboring valley, the first lake. Called the child beloved of the sky, the young ones sought to see the water that once they could walk. In secret, taking stone chips from the others to make their own pick, a child dug a secret tunnel to the lake. When discovered after being missing a short time, the adult discovered the child's tool could break other stones easily. Thus they became known as the child beloved of the mountain and sky. Their family moved next to the lake. Those, thus those clear waters would watch over the child's younger years. Both parents were makers of tools, a position of honor in the sparse society. They all, the beloved child showed their craft and cunning, taking their lessons in peaks at their parents' work. Often stealing scraps and slag to practice with, the child would learn to make tools to drive, dig, and siphon. How different stones could be used, and how some would require the heat of flames to show their true worth. Though maturing, the child showed great talent, their early tools able to pierce even harder stones once thought impossible. Their siphons brought fresher air further into the mines than any others, letting the diggers work for longer in comfort. Braces made with the child's support could hold better, letting them dig larger tunnels. So the town began to flourish, meeting other settlements, seeing their wealth, Others flocked to meet, joined to meet the child beloved of mountain and sky. But what of the child themselves? They were pressures and expectations that unfolded and expanded beyond any single person could ever expect. Surely they were a detached genius, lonely and longing to be normal. Nay. Or perhaps a virtuous saint, taking on the troubles of others and viewing it as their purpose and duty to do so. Nay, an arrogant youth, viewing their immense talents as their birthright, and crooning from dawn till dusk about the worship o their worship ode. Nay, the child was one surrounded by friends. Among them, the child was scolded lovingly, applauded on their accomplishments, and given unconditional affection. What dismayed relations and onlookers, was, the fam was that the family that gave her such things was unseen to their eyes. Truly, the girl was beloved. Wind bursts swelled around her. Stone all but hopped into her furnace that burned hotter than any other. The lake rippled with every strike of her smithing hammer. The industrious youth sought ever finer results. Implacable in their absolute dedication to their craft. Others sought to replicate her methods with varying results. None could match her work, but many lessons were imparted. This is how words began to be whispered behind her back, not out of jealousy, but admiration and thankfulness. Her tools brought, had brought many together and enabled the harvesting of foods so that many could live together in greater comfort. Despite this, the girl's connection to the unseen made them uneasy. So they called her goddess, to distinguish her, to praise her, to keep her above them. Still, she considers them her friends and family. Still, her hammer thundered down, shaping stone into tools. Still, she kept the unseen ones with her. But we then we turn to a different child, far away a child beloved of rules and rulers. In a place very far from the tranquil lake was another, was a city, sorry, likely one, the only one of its kind on the desolate world. Its vaunted towers covered in echelons meant to gather water and guide it into great tanks below. 
Each tank bore several guards that watched over those who would require it. It was on a rare day of rain that the great horn blared. First one, then more. Their great bleeding covered the valleys for miles. At first, none knew its significance. Then runners screamed through once the horns had gone silent. It was a joyous day. The queen of the land had given birth. As with all things in this land, some cheered and others jeered. The king had an air that meant that, meant that naked grabs for power beat would be less effective, but also that like any young one, the air could be molded. Even the most ambitious would be humbled mere hours later. The queen declared that she would give no more heirs, that her first child would be the only one. Her declaration set the tone for the new prince. Only the best were winnowed from the masses. The prince learned and learned. Their youth spent on learning how, from sprout to crown, how an empire functioned. And despite their attempts to, the prince gained something beyond wisdom. The prince gained understanding. Showing kindness to the masses by sneaking them food and water, they would return... The people would return the favor a hundredfold. The prince understood how to sway others. Bending the decisions of the king, the prince earned adoration in the eyes of many. His position ensured that the deference of more powerful scavengers who sought greater power. Each time they thought they'd trap him, the prince refused to fall into their traps. He refused to share time with their children did not dine with their families, and only spoke of common courtesies in their houses. The king was busy during the prince's youth. New tunnels brought new bodies to support and be sorted. Yet that same growth meant greater freedom to tame the great mountains. One fateful day, the king and queen called their child. The youth even saw the assemblage of every important person in the audience chamber. Hiding their anxiety and discomfort behind a practiced mask of assurance, the prince stood out before their parents. Mounted on the end of a long pole was a strange rock, unlike any other. The king told of a time when their ancestors found the stone after it fell from the sky. It could pierce the hide of even the thickest warrior and had felled many since its creation. So the king handed over the spear to the prince and gave him a quest. He would settle down the rebellion in another valley. It would not be able to return until it had been accomplished. So, with expectant escorts at his side, the prince traveled to the valley, if such a humble place could be been called that. Compared to the spiraling city that wound both skyward and deep into the world, the collection of hovels shocked the prince almost as much as the haggard enemies who had gathered in resentment. Trying to speak to the people, the prince was rebuffed. His words, for the first time, were shouted down, and the voices only grew louder as they recognized the spear he held. Not once had the prince thought of why his father had thought to give him such a thing, even worse, why it would be necessary. One who had lost a dear soul to that spear lunged for the prince. Without thought, the prince impaled this attacker. It was reactive. He truly didn't mean to, but the instructor had drilled into his body to strike back when it charged at. In horror, the prince watched the dying man reach for him, wanting revenge even as control of his limbs faded. What followed was a fight, more a slaughter, expounded outward from that instant. When the rebels lay motionless, the prince looked out upon the field. None would console nor approach him. In the end, five more would have fallen by his spear in the, at the, and lay bloody at his feet. The prince lamented and cursed his father for making this necessary. He spent the march home practicing the exact phrases he'd used to bring his father low. He'd throw the weapon at his father's feet and make his disgust known. 
Yet, what awaited him at the gate was a hero's welcome. Showers of accolades, praises, and tokens of thanks lined the road leading up to the spire of the king. The prince arrived before his parents, clutching his spear, some of the blood still clinging around the tip. The king stepped off his throne and withdrew a cloth. As the prince went to speak, the king wiped the blood off the spear. Words were whispered that sent chills down the spine of the prince. Whatever transpired between those two in that moment, the prince bowed his head and apologized for his negligence in cleaning the spear. Welcomed as a hero, the prince stood before his people, his legitimacy undeniable to all now. And, as some fatalistic sorts would say, their fates were sealed that day. A goddess protects, a king provides. Though distant, though distant, the valley saw travelers regularly. Most followed the tunnels, charting obstructions, floods, or other problems. Boldest among these vagabonds would be those that climbed over the mountains. One such soul was the start to the problems. Exhausted from days at high altitude, he found a strange valley filled with water. Thinking he'd gone mad, the hiker tried to climb down carefully. As one does when too tired, he overestimated the ease of getting down the slope. He tumbled down. Later, his body was found by a lone woman. When he awoke, his injuries had been tended to and some food had been left. Grateful for the kindness, the traveler spent time recovering. Listening to those around him, he learned of the goddess who had found him and tended to his wounds before bringing him to the one who would take care of him. Time had passed, and the naivete of youth had left the goddess at this point. She continued to hone her craft and produce tools that were, in, were incomparable to anyone else's. However, she'd also taught others her art to shape stone into metal. Her tools were traded among the mountains as relics and granted great, that granted great boons. The traveler saw the goddess only once and was amazingly smitten. Her strength and capable mind were evident to all. Once healed and thankful, the traveler sought to return home, facing the rough path over the mountains once more, more carefully this time. He did return to his home in the kingdom with tales of what he'd seen. As they do, these stories would grow with each retelling. Till they reached the capital, where the recently crowned new king heard the story in passing. Thinking it nothing more than a wild traveler's tale, he, he disregarded it. There were more pressing issues at hand, after all. The tanks, were un the tanks of water were unusually half full due to a drought, but a recently discovered underground lake had helped alleviate some of the pressure. Though moving the water had been slow, it had not affected its food stores much yet. In addition, there was pressure from the other major families to grant them ownership of the valleys, to help ensure that they were run properly. Of course, they'd also require a dispensation of troops to keep in order, or so they claimed. Days of deliberation had come to a standstill. Nobody had made any progress for or against this motion. Then, the story f from a from a far from far flung merchants reached the castle. Tales of the goddess made manifest made the topic of idle chatter. What began as speculation was silenced with a single comment from the king. A foolish suggestion given weight by unspoken frustrations. The king should claim the goddess and make her his queen. The idea was silly, selfish, and arrogant. Yet some about it spoke to a commonality they could support. To save their would-be queen from the savages of afar. Hearing this cry, the king dispatched scouts to begin the hunt for this rumored woman. Soon the kingdom was united by the desire for a queen who had been known as a goddess. 
yet none had told the goddess herself of their decision. Only a desperate, scared pilgrim crossed the mountains once more. Feeling he owed the goddess for saving his life, the traveler warned her of the kingdom's intentions. Unafraid, the goddess sought to break, bring the traveler before others. The people pleaded with her to prevent the attack. Fearful of what others would do to them, some wanted to offer her up as a sacrifice to the kingdom. Amid all this noise, the goddess spoke, and all fell silent. She told them she would not cower and would welcome them into their lands, as she had done all the rest. That so long as they sought not to harm another soul, they would not be harmed in kind. With her declaration made, the goddess returned to her forge. In hushed voices, she whispered to the unseen, asking for guidance in something she had no idea how to do. Fight, war, and slaughter, if need be. A tunnel was dug with an alarming speed, though. Time trickled by, and each strike of a pick measured out the moments that would be considered inevitable by both sides. And after a time, they beget both Valley and the kingdom would dig towards each other, eager to know the truth of what this meeting would bring. When they could hear the other side digging, both sent messengers to their leader. Such as it was, the king and the goddess met as the diggers on both sides broke through. It took some time for them to clear the passage large enough for them to meet. Armed only with her hammer, the goddess asked their intentions. The king pointed his family spear and declared his claim on the goddess of rumor. Then he promised the safety of all in their lands if she was brought forth. He stated plainly that the goddess would be his to help him unite the lands and bring their people to glory. The goddess asked, what good would glory do? You can't eat it, use it to make something, or even keep you warm. Stunned at the declaration, the king stood in silence. He was unused to being, he was used to being defied, but not being mystified. So those who had defied him in the past could be silenced eventually, but no, this, he had no response. The goddess identified herself and then did and then did as the unseen friends had bid her in her dark hours where no other could hear. She reached out and asked for an ally to help. Someone to do what she could not herself. Air swirled, sending all but the goddess fleeing backwards. Then, crouched low in the tunnel, was a beast. A large monster with red eyes and fanged maw. Its sudden arrival scared the king's soldiers. The workers behind the goddess shuddered and slowly sunk into the crevices of every rock. Determined not to show fear, the king thrust his familial weapon. But with a snap of its maw, the summoned monster crushed the head of the spear, then swallowed the remnants before hissing in fury that sent all fleeing. When they were alone, the monster lapped at the goddess's cheek affectionately. Shortly after that, the tunnel was collapsed by the kingdom. Unfortunately, their control of the neighboring valley was short-lived, since the summoned monster was able to easily clamber over the, over the mountain. Thus began the, the war. For a long time, the world seemed split in two with the great kingdom looming to the north and the southern people protected by the goddess and her monster. Even then, the goddess turned her attention, aw Even then, got the goddess turned her attention away from crafting weapons. Developing new ideas, she started to learn how to craft tools to kill. During the years she spent preparing, the monster had generated many spawns, lesser versions of itself that could fit where it could not. The goddess has had several chances to test her weapons on those foolish enough to cross the mountains. These had given her an understanding of conflict and the effectiveness of her creations. 
However, across the mountains, the king sat upon his throne. Hushed whispers followed him. A failure who could not even capture a queen. A coward who had lost his birthright to a monster. Every attempt to cross, be it under the mountains or above, had been met with failure. Going around was slow, and his leaders began to calling into question his abilities. When he'd solved the lack of food, they mocked him. When he'd added tanks and found new ways to melt water from the peaks to provide for his people's needs, they derided him. All because they had decided on their own that he was only fit for one queen. But so long as that monster could cross the barriers, he had no recourse. That was when a soft-voiced person entered his chambers. Words and promises were whispered. Promises of power capable of weakening the monster. Letting mortals slay it. Up to this point, its hide had resisted even the best crafted blades. Even in his dreams, the king heard the mocking words. He swore to the soft-spoken being that if it could end the voices, he would do anything. So they reached an agreement. If the monster was slain, the soft-spoken being would be made his official priest. The plan was set in motion. Moving their forces into, into a nearby valley, they captured the spawn of the monster. Trapping them in cages, they left them in a particular pass. On both sides were steep cliffs. As expected, the monster came to find its crying children. Rain poured down that day. Then rocks poured down that cliff. The monster smashed the cages and shielded its children as best it could only to slip, falling down the cliff. The children fled back home. After the last boulder was pushed down and the rain passed, the king hurried down into the crevasse. Finding the corpse of the monster, he ordered it butchered, and that the diggers to return to their original cave and double its width. Messengers were dispatched, warning the goddess must surrender herself or every valley in her protection would be burned. Once more, in the same place the two had met, in the past, this time the goddess bore her own spear, and many others bore her weapons of war. The king's soldiers had fang-tipped spears and shields covered in familiar hide. The pair didn't discuss anything this time. There was nothing to talk over. One had been disgraced, and the other pined for what was lost. And in the intervening days, pain had burrowed into their hearts. What now smoldered as faded agony now blossomed as fury. In the goddess's hands, her spear sent shockwaves through all it pierced. Some fell blind, others deafened, and even more crippled in countless ways that did not kill. Not a single soul in that first battle was ended by her hand, nor for those who followed her, and thus her vindictive victory was secured. As the stars rose, a great fire was held, dispersing the stolen parts of the monster, leaving it in memory of those who had secured and lost so much. The goddess whispered, a soft, silent promise to avenge what had been done. And for the first time, the goddess left her domains. Taking the boldest with her, she marched towards the enemy. Welcomed as liberators with open arms, the goddess marched through almost uninhibited. They passed through valleys, adding to their numbers. The people adored the goddess, and she frequently halted to assist more neglected places the king hadn't, adding food to where they could, where they were hungry, allowing certain mines and expanding to make homes, enabling the others to break through seams that had been all but impenetrable before. Perched in his tower, scouts reported frequently to the king. 
As he listened, listened, the newly appointed priest stood at his side. They both smiled at some shared joke that none in the great chamber could know. Others seemed nervous of her army, and its growth, and the tunnels lost to her. Yet the king was perfectly assured. With her army within striking range of the tower, the goddess rested, letting everyone gather to avenge her fallen friend. The night was dark and long. Clouds gathered, yet no rain fell. And it was in those deep shadows that flames found the goddess. Untamable blazes roared through her camp. Jagged arrows tore through flesh and snapped bones. Screams echoed all around. Amidst the chaos came the king, descending down from the mountains after the last shaft was sped. The rest of his army erupted from secret tunnels. Traitors amidst the goddess's army made themselves known, slaying their once allies. Exhausted and weakened from the fighting, the goddess could barely lift her spear when the king found her. Knocking her weapons away, he whispered the words that had chilled his soul as a youth from his father. An absolute truth is that in war there is no justice, just a means to an end. And for glory's favor we begin. Jules caught in the morning light as it slowly lowered into the valley. Despite the early hour, the murmur of quiet conversations was almost deafening in its volume. Some had left their homes in the middle of the night. All had heard the army returned a few days prior, but no word had come from the results. Every soldier who lined the square hadn't taken part in the fighting, so could only answer honestly that they knew nothing. More light descended and glittering gems flashed above the square. Then the gems shifted and their almost blinding glare silenced on all. A headdress adorned in bright metals and gems shone from above. Approaching the dais above the square, the king raised his arms. Explaining his victory over the goddess, the king was soaked in adulation. Then he stepped to the side to reveal the new queen. Decorated in brilliant cuffs and a similar headdress, the goddess saw countless beings, che beings cheering her captivity. Though only a few days had passed since her capture, she knew it was pointless to do anything here. Her people were under watchful eyes and countless bows. So the queen waved and greeted her new servants. The king was not seen for the rest of the day. Many hushed whispers came about about him furthering the bloodline. Thus began the king's joy. T'was not long till a child was confirmed. Not wanting to be far from the queen, the king named several servants to take care of the outer regions, including the home of the queen. Many conflicts, many of the conflicts in his audience chamber became easier to handle, and he focused on preparing what would be needed for his own child, as his parents had done for him. Unsurprisingly, there came the request for assistance with the queen's homeland. Many refused to believe or follow their new ruler's orders, even at the threat of Bullpoint. The king and qu so the king and queen made their way there. Seeing the queen left all awestruck, not only because of the number of soldiers in her escort, but the fact she was obviously pregnant. Meeting her family, the queen was given her old smithing tools, the pretense for her visit. Upon their return to the tower, the queen was sequestered. Her private chambers was act as prison and fortress against any potential machination against the king's child. And before long, a daughter was born. Despite giving birth, the queen was not permitted out of her chambers. Her incarceration began due to the king's absence. His orders left her in the tower as he went on his expeditions. The reason for his departures were his trusted allies he'd sent to watch over his land 
had raised forces in rebellion, claiming their own divine rights, each sought to bring others into their lands. So the king began new wars, going far afield to retain what his ancestors had built. When one was cowed by might or cunning, another would resist. Months stretched into years, and though the emotional daggers became a multitude in the king's back, he did not complain. Instead, he would visit his priest and offer ab ablutions to the needs of his people. In her long captivity, the queen's jailers became complacent, allowing her to roam, and eventually she managed to gather enough to create a forge. Like her own childhood, due to the king's absence and lack of influence on their child, the queen's daughter spent it watching the creation of tools. Day in and day out, the queen made only tools that had no malicious intent. Dining ware, vents for air, replacement limbs, and other mundanities. A simple life that greatly resembled her old one. The only difference was the occasional intrusion of the king. Emotionally exhausted, he'd stumble in, too tired despite his intentions to sire another heir. Instead, the queen would watch over him as he slept, feeding him when he stayed long, and long to try and impart some lesson to their daughter. Eventually, she gathered up his assembled tutors. She, eventually, she was gathered up by his assembled tutors to rule one day. It was during this time that a great battle took place. In a valley adjacent to the towers, the united forces of the outlying region managed to push so far into the heart of the king's domain. Days of fighting came and went. Trenches and walls rose and were torn down. Stones raised in some places and soft earth gave way to angry pits of jagged spikes and others. Yet none could strike a decisive blow. Though al along, though along the way, the king's fervor drove soldiers onward until they couldn't move. So came the worst affront of the king's life. He was forced to declare a truce with his enemies. And then, shocked but unbowed, the king offered nothing but praise for his army, commending their bravery and diligence that kept the tower safe. After that day, the king did not visit the queen, nor checked on his daughter's progress, which had actually been inspiring the, to the queen. Her daughter had shown no sense for the unseen, nor did her creations beam with the same powers that the queen did. Instead, the daughter had the gift of foresight, often forestalling problems long before they became an issue. Her sharp mind could also bend like the most gnarled root, often making those with petty or selfish intentions learn the futility of such an action. Despite her maturity, the princess still retained a playful side, making games that she could play with her captive parent. It was, during, it was during one such bout between parent and child that news arrived. The queen and the daughter would be required for a meeting. The king would be inviting his former servants into the tower to discuss making a treaty that would last years. Exhilarated by the prospect of being involved in a political event, the daughter spent much of the following night charting potential courses for her lands, cutting deals and shaping the land in her mind into a thriving land beyond even the king's designs. That night, the ringing from the queen's forge, the queen's forge was ceaseless. Days piled up, eclipsed only by the anxiety of the tower's residents. Details were attended to in quintuplet. Any faults found could reflect poorly on a king for whom his pride had become everything. Punishments were readily handed out in the days leading up to the meeting. Guarded and guided down into the meeting hall, the queen dressed in the same items she'd worn on the day she was given the title. Adjustments and new jewels glittered on her headdress. A smaller one decorated the head of her daughter. 
The entrance of the king, the entrance made by the king, stood, stand up and show, hang on, I wrote this wrong. <laughs> their entrance, oh, their entrance made the king stand up and made a show of complimenting both of them enough to make him seem cordial. The guards guided the pair to their position, flanking the king to one side, and on the other side was the priest. Several other followers adorned in shadowy robes. The daylight filled the chamber as guests arrived one by one, each flanked by their own trusted guards. The king had even permitted a limited force of their private armies into the tower. The first day was spent on introductions, titles, and making positioning clear. The second day, brisk deliberations began with veiled threats of, of, with veiled threats of might behind them. The third and fourth days were bogged down by minutia and absentees. During days five through ten, heated arguments over boundary lines raged. It was on the fourteenth day of deliberations that the king entered a chamber flanked by the queen and their daughter, but more so by the priest and their more numerous servants. All cloaked in black, they dominated the back part of the audience chamber. Determined not to be cowed by the display, the former servants of the and would-be kings tried to begin deliberations. The king silenced them with a wave of his hand and made an announcement. He would be retaking all his rightful lands, explaining that none of the traitors the king, to the king would be leaving the chamber and thanked them for their sacrifice. Immediately, weapons were drawn, but even the mightiest warrior, warrior was overwhelmed by the priest's followers. The queen demanded an explanation. Eager to boast, the king told her that he'd poisoned all of them and would sacrifice them to a right to bestow them with him with power. Their daughter recoiled in horror as the king admitted that the only way to be sure they were poisoned was to poison the tanks that all drank from. Outside... The screams of slaughter and violence raged. The king giggled and laughed as he hurled, hurried out onto the square. Below, soldiers and civilians slaughtered each other. Passing through the violence untouched were the priest's followers, placing symbols on every corpse they passed. The king began to emit an aura of hatred. The queen and daughter found themselves hating him. The king smiled and the queen's eyes widened. The unseen ones whispered in her ear what had begun. He'd given up personhood, morality, and individuality for the power to rule. He was a monster that grew off hatred. Hatred of him, his hatred of others, hatred of their sparse world. Hate! 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 Their aura of anger grew, becoming tangible so none could approach the king. Worse still, his orders were still followed by those who weren't weakened by the poison, and the tower was consumed in hatred and chaos. Blood followed. Two figures kept to the side of the road far from the tower. Cloaked in black robes, both carried spears, in the faint light of torches, you could still make out bloodstains around the spear points. Time was measured in breaths as the pair fended off the followers of hate and their own exhaustion in equal measure. The queen tried to reassure her daughter that it wasn't far now. And it was true. It wouldn't be far till they reached their homeland. To her hut by the lake she'd left so long ago. The unseen urged her on, promises of sanctuary growing more fervent the closer they drew. Though, as if to spite their desperate parent and child, the winds swirled even in the tunnels. Black cloaks, the harbinger of the king's hatred, had spread out in all directions. In a matter of days, every valley had a group of darkly clad soldiers. Sometimes they'd torture a group, lavish another with gifts, and others they'd kill outright, always seemingly arbitrary. Only the queen understood. Of those who had been in the chamber, 
at his ascension, only she had come through unharmed. Her chamber had a private water source, a meager luxury she was thankful for now. Her daughter had not come away unscathed. Some of the poison sent her into coughing fits periodically. She knew the king's goal was to be hated, because by doing so, he could pull on all the souls of those he injured. The unseen hissed loudly when several cloaks approached. The queen readied her spear and waited. In the tunnel, there weren't places to hide, but traps could be present all the same. Errant arrow shots sh showered this tunnel in sparks. The queen bit her lips. The barbed heads were likely, had likely been from her own forge. Now turned against her, the queen could only seek meager cover of a nearby rock. A hand clutched her cloak and the queen stumbled backwards. Her eyes wide in horror, seeing her daughter had been the one to push her away. Then she saw why. The archers had never intended to strike them. Instead, a powder barrel was hidden amid behind her chosen hiding spot. The final shot struck the ceiling enough to sparks to finally reach the powder. All at once, the world consumed in a violent roar that was followed by pained silence. Stillness ruled the world around the queen. Most agonizing was a single limb protruding from the rubble. Sobs broke the silence for a long time. Even as the unseen pulled and attempted to drag away the grieving parent, the queen ignored them. She uttered a single lie. You would have hated being a ruler. It was then that the daughter joined the unseen and whispered a truth to the queen. Father and his black cloaks are devouring souls. As the daughter faded, the goddess rose to stand. With a wipe of her hand, the rocks melted and shifted, reshaping themselves into a tomb for the daughter. The rest of the stone parted to reveal shocked black cloaks, in a flash of fury, the goddess's spear, goddess spear tore through their cloaks. Gaping holes from their impalements left them desperately gasping at their runes. The runes. The unseen quaked and pleaded for her to continue. Sparing only a glance to the elegant stonework that would enshrine the pain of loss of her child, the goddess continued on. Reaching the other end of the tunnel, the goddess's shoulders lowered. Another truth revealed by the bare buildings, all bearing scorch marks. It had been long enough that only some scattered bones remained of the vibrant people who had lived here with her long ago. Passing through the ruins, the goddess was surprised at the numbness and pain that had melted together. A new agony marked the goddess, a ragged, gaunt figure, scrambled out from the ruins, Discarding their bow for a short, chipped blade stained with rust, the point trembled in quaking hands. Desperately, the attacker thrust forward. But the goddess was faster and had greater reach. Her spear tore open a gaping orifice in the man. Collapsing, the man clutched at his missing side. He hissed, I believed in you, Gore goddess. It wasn't until the light faded from his eyes and ro that rolled back that the goddess recognized him, the traveler that had stumbled into her home so long ago. Now his story has ended. The goddess proceeded to her old home. The humble forge by the water had no sign of damage. Even new tools had been made to replace her old ones that had been taken with her to the tower. Taking a fresh bit of metal, the goddess began to shape it. Alone, the ringing of her hammer was her only companion. From the water rose a head, narrow with wide jaw. As the creature opened its mouth, it explained, We of the world love you. We would offer you the tools to create a happier future. Joined by another being on great wings, it whispered, for as things stand right now, the king of hatred shall consume every soul and spread like a plague. Why? the goddess mumbled. 
Because we love... No, why now? Where were you when my army was routed? Each day I spent alone shaping tools and weapons for the bastard who... The goddess sobbed. Both spirits spoke in unison. We were always there. The monster who had guarded those lands looked over from a further down the lakeside. We all were. You no longer called out to us. Hatred of that man stole your joy and awareness of all that was around you. But we loved you, so we stayed and watched you. But even in your shared hatred, you found something to be happy about. The goddess recalled her daughter. So what now? The winged one whispered. We give you ourselves, granting you ascension naturally that the king would take by force. The wide-mouthed creature rose further from the water, revealing its cylindrical body. The sky grew cloudy as it added. From there, it is up to you how to use our power. Just know... If you do nothing, this world shall be dead. There is not enough life left in the living to revive it. Do it. The goddess accepted. Wherein our story begins. A storm raged and battered the battlements of the tower. Every tank of water had overflowed days ago. The chaos and fury had spilled out hours before. Now only the meager survivors of the pursued the last few dry locations. Then, as quickly as the storm descended, it ended. Eyes gathered to marvel at the open skies above. Their gaze beheld twin silvery wings. A long cylindrical body attached to the wings ended in a narrow head. The great monster they beheld boomed. King of hatred, I hereby banish you from this world. Descending, the great beast coiled around the tower. The, the tower was quickly turned to blood and rubble. Erupting from the stone were long, flexible limbs. Dozens of them erupted from the rock. The goddess's new wings beat the air. Despite the clinging arms, she rose above the mountain, dragging the bulbous main body airborne. The creature fist hissed. You fool! In destroying my form, you only freed me. I am the master of this world. No! The goddess responded, spinning her body. The goddess sent the newly released god of hatred further skyward. Wind spun the god violently as javelins of stone and steel rose from the mountain, sticking into its orb-like main body. The goddess has called down bolts of lightning and from the open sky. Leaping upon the charred and beaten god of hate, her mouth opened wide. Bite after bite tore its flesh apart, all while the god of hatred laughed. He mocked. Don't you understand? So long as you hate me, you'll never be rid of me. Blobs of the god fled into holes torn in the open skies. Only his laughter remained. The goddess rose above the sky into the infinite black. During her ascension, all of creation seemed immensely vast, but also incredibly small at the same time. Then her eyes returned to the stony gray rock that had been her home. She could sense no life left in that world. The god of hate had driven many to sacrifice themselves, and those that survived were crushed beneath that fight. Using her newfound power, the goddess restored everything to as it was in her memories. Then the world was sealed away from all, hidden away, a jewel to remember what her origins were. The goddess swore, I shall find or make a weapon to kill you, god of hate, my bitter husband, for your own sake as much as our daughter's. She then vanished among the stars to make good on her vow. These would be the story of two fools. And how are they related to me? You'll see in time. But this is the story, the furthest back I can go, that will be relevant to my own story. So, with this, episode zero, episode fool, comes to a close. Thank you all for joining me. 
and I'll be continuing this story another time. Bye for now, folks. Bye for now.